Hello and welcome to Claret and Blue and our Inside Bodymore show as John Townley reports back from Inside Bodymore Heath for a latest press conference from Unai Emery. Up next is Burnley away on Sunday afternoon, so we're going to get stuck into predicted 11 predictions and what Emery said this afternoon. Before that though, question for you John, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you, Dan? Yeah, good. It's uh, five o'clock on a Friday afternoon as we record this and this should be out Friday evening. Obviously, got the bit of extra breathing room with the game being Sunday rather yep. than Saturday afternoon. Uh, one I'm, I'm really looking forward to and seeing Villa play. We've kind of seen two halves of Villa so far, haven't we? With the the bad mm-hmm. game at Newcastle and a very good game against Everton, who were a poor side. I actually think this Burnley game is going to be re- really interesting. We'll start with the presser. How was Unai Emery this afternoon? <laughs> yeah, really good. Um, in good spirits. Obviously, as you, you mentioned there, Dan Villa have won the last two games, scored. Nine goals, haven't conceded, but the opposition have been really poor. I said after the Everton game that I don't think Villa will play an easier game all season. And then we play Hibs. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's too much you can take from take from those games, apart from player confidence. Emery did say in his press conference today as well that the defeat against Newcastle, that probably you know informs him more about or gives him information about his players more so than beating Everton and Hibs because they they were so poor. Obviously, Everton are a better team than Hibernian, we know that, but they dip below the levels even then and they're not a great team. So, yeah, he mentioned that there's probably more that he learnt from the Newcastle game rather than those two wins more recently. And I'm with you, Dan. I think Burnley will be a good a good test because they obviously didn't play last week, as we'll get on to. Mm. And then Villa are going to be playing, obviously, Hibs at home next week, which is a virtually irrelevant game. But then Liverpool away, so two... Two difficult tests against two very different teams as well, both away from home. So let's see where Villa find themselves come the international break. I think that would be a good barometer of where the season is because, as you just say, we've had a we've had the high and the low in the in the first two weeks of the season. So we kind of need to just to settle down and see where we are. And I actually think, and we'll get on to predictions in a bit, that this Burnley game probably will middle out a little bit compared to the highs and lows of Newcastle and and uh, Everton. Injury news is Emi Martinez is, is an interesting one. He came off at half-time against Hibs and we were kind of half inclined to think, well, maybe he's got a very slight knock and there's absolutely no risk in this in the rest of this game. Let's just take him off as a precaution. But since then, there's been pictures of him with, with ice strapped to his calf and Emery says that a decision will be made on the final training session, which will be tomorrow. Um, mm-hmm. If he's not to play, obviously that's a huge blow, but it's just one of those ones that are just kind of easing their way through it and Martinez will start on Sunday, do you think? I, I think so, yeah. And again, this isn't inside information or anything, but I'd, I'd be surprised if a small calf injury keeps Martinez out of a game against Burnley. I know we play Liverpool next, but I'm not so sure. I, don't get me wrong, if he causes a bit more damage, then it might be a couple of weeks that he misses, which isn't um, ideal. However, I think Emery saying that we'll see how he's in training tomorrow means that he's able to train for a start so the fact he missed training today was just to mm. recover um i know goalkeepers need to be in the rhythm and outfield players need to train in you know different ways for tactics and for physical reasons but i feel like emmy martinez could probably skip a couple of days of training and he would still be ready for the weekend again he needs the rhythm to go into the game but um yeah we'll, they'll see how he is tomorrow but i think if he misses the game it'll be because he can't play and Villa need him. He's so important and we know there's a, a big drop off. Whoever the goalkeeper is that replaces him, obviously it'll be Olsen, but that's nothing against Olsen necessarily, although he's not um, you know, everything you want on a goalkeeper. Whoever it is that's replacing him, Martin is in the Villa team. Villa have got an issue there. So I think they'll do everything to make sure he can play. And if he can't, then there we go. Um, it maybe it isn't so much of a small pain. It's probably something a bit more um, I want to say serious he's not going to be out for months or anything like that it might just be one game and he'll be back but you'd like to think that it'll be in place against Burnley and, and it'll all be okay Talk to me about Nicolo Zaniolo as well we spoke about it live on air like, funny enough for the, Bur- the Burnham, Hibernian post-match show of why he wasn't available and there was people in our comment section suggesting that he was cup-tied and then I saw Jacob Tanswell from The Athletic tweet something like Villa and Emery were told that Zaniolo couldn't play in Europe and all the replies yeah. were like why have we signed a player that can't play in the European competition? How have Villa been so silly? But it's just the playoff round, isn't it? And from our interpretation of the rule book that I read out on the last show, once Villa get into the group stage, which let's face it, they are already in, Saniolo becomes available in Europe and he is available to start Sunday as well if if selected. Yeah, it's just the preliminary rounds, so playoff qualification, those rounds, Galatasaray. I didn't know that he played in them, to be fair, for Galatasaray. And no, I, feel, I, I feel a bit silly for asking him, because I've asked him and when... Um, 
Oh, God, when was it now? It would have been after the Everton game. I, I would have asked him, can he play? And Emery obviously said, uh, yes, he can play. He can make his debut in that game. And I feel a bit silly that I've asked him the question, knowing that I should probably be aware that he can't. If You know what I mean? I've, it's not my job to... Like, and Emery did, uh, did say he was available. So I, I think Villa yeah. thought he would have been available. because Yeah, it, I think it might have been... been and I don't know this, but it might have been the case that Villa submit their squad for the for the for the playoff game, um, and then UEFA might have come back and said, "Oh, he can't play," and mm. they're just putting Amari Kellyman or whoever was there instead of him. So it doesn't matter. But it was just a shame that he couldn't have played because it'd have been a good, good opportunity, and especially in, in the home leg, he could have had ninety minutes there. Again, no insider information, no nothing at all, just wild speculation on my part, and we kind of guess how much Villa knew about what happened with the Zaniolo thing. He did travel up to Hibernian. And he was there. It's like, <laughs> if the player isn't ready to go and even feature, like, does he have to travel all the way up there? Like, part of me feels like they were prepared to play him and found it on the Maybe day. I don't, that again, he I, feature. I don't know. We, there was a few spaces left in our on our bench. Um, I know it's Hibernian. Hibernian, sorry, had two or three players extra on their bench. Than us. So maybe, I've no idea. I mean, yeah. Doesn't that, matter. I'm just, I'm just speculating you. for the cause of yeah. let's just let's just get <laughs> let's get away from match day out of the way then because there's not really that much else to talk about around around the edges of the game. The only thing that has been that the third kit came out today, which is a yeah. nice little surprise, just dropped out of nowhere. Again, some wild speculation for me. Uh, a few mm-hmm. people saying that the third kit was launched today because we'll be playing in it against Burnley on Sunday. But based off previous seasons gone by, when Villa do their their graphics and stuff and social media leading up to a game. They tend to pick the colour scheme for the kit they're wearing. So Villa's graphics and social media this week have all been white and all the players are in the white kit. Yeah, I think we'll be playing in the white kit against Burnley because it's an away game. But I, I get it. Claret and blue versus blue doesn't also well, really quite work. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to wear Claret shorts and Claret socks, maybe. I think that's probably my white, prediction for that. Yeah, white shirt, Claret they, socks. That'd be great. They have, white, they have white shorts and white socks, I believe. That's usually a Burnley kit. The third kit, I noticed you've got... I don't know what year that was from, but it's a similar sort of... Similar shade of blue, isn't it? I don't mind it. I know. I think I don't know. I'm I'm just not a fan of um like <laughs> too many patterns on a kit. I'm quite boring. I like it to be plain and smart and clean. Um, and it's nice. Don't get me wrong, but it's also practically identical to Wolves' third kit. So I don't think there's much yeah. imagination that's gone into it. And I'm not a massive fan. I've, the away shirt's quite nice. I think the white one. Yeah, I just like a plain kit. I'm quite boring with that sort of stuff. Like the badge I wanted was just a lion. <laughs> kit, I just want to be claret with a bit of blue <laughs> in your way shirt, just white, like it's boring. It'd be interesting to see what shade of blue it becomes once they look like they've been drenched in a swimming pool and they start playing in it. And what I don't like, and this is probably not, this isn't just a villa thing, this is a thing across the whole Premier League, is the prices of the football shirts these days and kits is ridiculous. And I'm probably more aware of this now that I've got a, a son that one day I'll be in a stage where he's asking for the new shirt, the third shirt, the away shirt, the shorts. And I'm thinking, well, it's not just 40 quid for, for a top like it used to be. It's 70 something quid for the shirt. The training wear is 60 odd quid. It, it's very expensive to, to kick yourself out in the new stuff when a lot of the secondhand retro things you can pick up, like this shirt behind me was 20 quid or something on eBay. And it's like, I know it's years old, but if I've got money to spend, I'd rather split it over a couple of older shirts and spend hundreds of pounds on the new stuff every single year. It's, it's not That's great. How, um, there's a huge demand for it. So the costs are going through the roof. I mean, cost of loan crisis is it's another debate anyway or not a debate sorry another real thing I saw Leeds were charging about 50 quid for a championship ticket as well like yeah. completely different but just the prices of everything it's just mental Sheffield, Sheffield, is that Sheffield Wednesday look, as well I'm sure their tickets yeah. have gone up a lot and they're bottom of the league I know it's early doors but yeah not it's, nice anyway a little moan out of the way um, another thing just away from match day very quickly I wanted to ask about Ollie Watkins about so people are getting a little bit tetchy about his contract situation. Somebody literally tweeted me before we started this saying, has John asked Emery about Ollie Watkins' contract situation lately? And if not, can we? Okay. Um, I would actually quite like to do a podcast about Watkins at some point, whether it's a segment in our Monday show where we sit down together and do a, a chat about Watkins maybe in person. Um, leave your opinions on Watkins for us. I'll, I'll be interested to see the, the split of the opinion where some people think he's very good and will score 20 goals and other people think we should get rid of him. Have you asked about the contract? <laughs> yeah, I asked him a few weeks ago, uh, I don't know, three weeks ago maybe, and he just said he was hopeful they'd sign it and obviously the club won't that to happen there's not much you can say about it when you know talks have already started about it which happened months ago so i don't know i mean it's, it's probably normal you know Watkins is a top striker his contract's running not running down but it's entering where well, he's in the final two years isn't he and there's top clubs probably looking for strikers um they're they're rare these days aren't they mm. there's a lot of 
a lot of teams who would love to um, have Ollie Watkins in their team, especially a, a fee that isn't um, his full market value, should we say. You can't ask every week, is there an update on Watkins' situation? that They're just not going to um, answer your questions eventually. So maybe in a few um, few more weeks, maybe next month or something, we can open it back up. I c- you can imagine his agent probably wanting to, or advising him, you know, you can have a pick of clubs uh, come the summer in terms of there's going to be a lot of interest in you. Villa will still demand a big fee, of course, if, if this was the case. Um, and ultimately, the, the more... I don't want to say desperate. The more the more desperate Villa are to sign him, the more money he's going to get, basically. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I don't think it's uh, it's not a situation where oh he's not going to sign. It's not that. It's just he's being um, it's been smart. And again, Watkins has got very, as every footballer does, very intelligent people surrounding him that are going to do the best for his career. And that's the whole point of uh, of it all. So I don't I don't think it's an issue. And um, yeah, hopefully hopefully he'll sign eventually. But um, yeah, he just needs to be in a position where he can get the best for himself. And that's, uh, yeah, as I say, that's what it's about. Let's do the opposition view then, the part of the show where we speak to somebody from the opposing camp. This time it's Natalie, big Burnley fan and the host of a podcast that's been going since 2009. So one of the first uh, football podcasts ever. Never one mind. of the first podcasts ever? <laughs> yeah, but never mind, just for Burnley. I caught up with her earlier today and uh, here's what she had to say. Right, Natalie, thanks for joining me. You're the, the host of the No Nay Never podcast. Now, I've got five questions for you about Burnley as we yeah. play Burnley on Sunday. First question, and it's a bonus one before we get into it. What's No Nay Never? Where does that come uh, from? <laughs> so, No Nay Never all comes back to the East Lanks Derby, the bitter rivalry yeah. between Burnley fans and Blackburn fans. It's, it's a well-documented, um, long-standing rivalry. Um, it literally is what it says on the tin. It's the Irish song that you all know um, and we all sing in the pub when uh, around St. Patrick's Day um, and Burnley fans and Blackburn fans have chanted that to each other with um, slightly different lyrics and with words not suitable for family viewers um, ever for the longest I can remember so when we first started None and Ever back in 2009, back in the day before you needed to beat algorithms and have keywords mm. in your and tags in your, your content to get you found, um, None and Ever seemed to be a really, a really good thing so that's how we were born. So Burnley obviously took the championship by by storm last season, winning the league with over 100 points, which I'm sure you're still delighted about. Um, <laughs> we did our season preview, obviously for Villa, but we kind of looked at a few other sides as well. Now I can't really work out whether Burnley's momentum and the style of football they played last year translates well into the Premier League and they finish 11th, 12th and have a good year, or you're going to be involved in a relegation scrap. I can't, <laughs> quite, I can't quite work it out. It seems to be one or the other. As somebody who's seen Burnley a lot more than I have, how do you assess your kind of uh, ambitions for the season? I mean, I don't think I could have put it any more perfectly. And I think that's okay, very cool. much where we are as well. There seems to be a real optimism in football media generally. And people aren't talking about Burnley in a relegation battle. And uh, we're not really that much in the betting odds. We're down there because we're nearly promoted. I think you always should be. But most people are saying, oh, no, no, Burnley will be fine. And I keep looking at this and going, where has this optimism come from? And, and to be honest, I'm not going to lie. I think a lot of it is down to the, the manager. We struggled a lot in a lot of our Premier League years of being the unfashionable club and the club that people think didn't deserve to be there. And we had Sean Dyche and people didn't like his football. And a lot of fans were just like, I can't wait till they get relegated and they'll be gone forever. Um, the rebirth of this club now with the new owners and the new manager is a completely different kettle of fish. You're not, you know, throw away everything you thought you knew about Burnley because it does not apply anymore. Um, mm. And I wonder whether the unconscious bias that exists in a lot of the mainstream media has now deflected onto us and people just see Vincent Company in a winner and he smashed the championship, that that will automatically translate. There is every single chance that Burnley, Luton and Sheffield United go down with a whimper. Um, there's every chance that we could be massively naive in trying to play the football we want to play and we go down. But there's every single chance that we finish higher. I don't think we'll finish higher than about 13th. I'm going to say 14th or 15th if we survive. But yeah, it literally could go one of two ways. Just as a quick follow-up there for something you mentioned about the kind of preconceptions of Burnley. Mm-hmm. I think it's one that you look at on the fixture list and go, Turf, more difficult place to go. Just <laughs> some years gone by that they'll sit in deep. Does that still apply, or is that an old kind of misconception as well? Yeah, I think I think this style of football doesn't apply anymore. You're not going to come to Turf mm. Moor and find eleven men. You're not going to find Ben Mead putting his face on the line and a boot to stop a ball going in. That that kind of dogged defensive grit has gone from the team. We're much more. Um, showmanship now we're much more about entertainment which is amazing I I hadn't realised how much I'd missed that level of football Um, 
But the DNA of the club is still there. It's still Turf Moor in winter with the hills and the snow and the wind. Um, it's still an atmosphere that's very supportive of its, of its home side. It's still very, um, you know, difficult to play there. If you come on a Tuesday night under the lights, it's a horrible place to play your football. It's a very um, passionate ground. But you know what? Villa Park's exactly the same. So I don't, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know if we're any different to some of the clubs whose home fans massively get behind them. Um, I'd, I, you know, we we have to make turf more very difficult place to play football because in the Premier League you are restricted with the number of games that you can expect to win. Not well. Villa won't be this year because you're going to run right over the league if, if, if what we're, we're hearing is true. Um, but for those of us at the bottom who are trying to survive, um, you have to make your home ground as tough as possible because there's not yeah. as many chances to win as, as in other leagues. Uh, you mentioned company at, at the beginning. Bar accounts is a very intelligent spoken, very kind of well-spoken, comes across very well in, in press conferences and in interviews as well. If you had to describe kind of the job that he's done so far and, and how he is as a manager and his kind of tactical style, can you give us a bit of a summary into into what company has been like? I think what I would probably categorise it is, is that he has brought modern footballing technique and style to a traditional community club and has made us relevant again in 2023. I think that's probably how I would summarise it. He is um, he's in, his, in his early stage of his managerial career, and he's the first one to admit that he hasn't achieved anything yet. When people talk to him about last season, about being favourite for the Spurs job, the Chelsea job, he kept saying, why, why are you saying this? I'm a championship manager. I'm not a Premier League manager. I've never managed a, a side in the Premier League. He's, he's very honest and he's very reflective about the stages in his career, and that keeps him mm. very hum- uh, humble. He's unbelievably driven. He kept saying last season, when we even when we won the title and smashed the championship, you know, we're not number one in the championship. We are the twenty-first best side yeah. in English football. And I think that's a really profound way of of looking at. It. I bet the players hate it. They're like, "Come on, Mark! You're like, can we at least <laughs> celebrate for a minute?" He's always pushing them to do more. Yeah. Um, because he's from the northwest, because of his Manchester ties as well, he gets the area and he mm. understands the club and he understands the fans and he's integrated himself very, very quickly. So he also understands where Burnley sits as a footballing community. And I think he has blended all of those elements together and he's mm. created something really special. And you've only played one game so far in the Premier League, which we've, we've <laughs> spoken about in our, in the rest of the show. We've spoken about obviously Villa have played uh, a game in Europe, an extra Premier League game in you as well. So whether that kind of has any impact on the game. Are you finding the the step up back so far? I know it's Man City for the first game, which is a, <laughs> yeah. a bit of um, um, I don't know what the word is when you're thrown into the fire or baptism whatever. Baptism of fire, yeah. But baptism um, of fire, that's it. Yeah, how how's it been so far? Um, it's been fine. I mean, I was actually relatively pleased when the fixtures came out because I can't think of a better time to play Manchester City. Um, I always think that. Yeah. yeah, get yeah. It out of the way. Um, it's the home tie. It's a free hit for us. Nobody's going to look down or judge our season if we get beat. It was only 3 0 and not 6 0. So there's a three goal swing difference from when we played them in the cup. Um, <laughs> I, what I was pleased, I, I came off the first game and said, you know what, that was my most enjoyable and optimistic of all of our city defeats, of which there have been many. I didn't know how company was going to set up for the Premier League. And he said before the game, look, this is going to be the worst you'll see us play this season because we're playing the best in the league. But also, we're new. We haven't quite got our team selection settled yet we've still got new players to come in so this we're only going to get better from here and to see them go out and play the football that they want to play and to not be afraid of it to really press yes they were absolutely shattered yes they got run riots there was defensive holes because Haaland's ridiculous um but they'll do that to most of the sides in this league this season so I was really pleased to see us stick to what we wanted to do and to not be afraid and to play like we earned a right to be there. And I think against some of the more winnable games in the league, I think that will serve as well. I think it's going to be a really interesting matchup on Sunday with if Burnley are playing yeah. the way they do at home and Villa want to play the way they do. It's fascinating, I think. I normally do strengths and weaknesses as two questions because I asked you a bonus one. I want to keep this as tight as I normally do. Sure. Can you just give me a bit of a summary on what Burnley are good at and what they're not good at in a, a minute or two? We're very good at the press. We are very Mm. good at possession football now, which is unheard of for Burnley. Um, The Burnley you know anyway. We are Mm. entertainers, we are creators, and we are now very good at 
playing out from the back, which is also very new and, and, and very strange Time for us. for us, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're very good at staying in games. We don't let our heads go down. We've got a good attitude and we are now very good at believing that we've earned our right to believe in this division and not be one of the ones making up numbers. What we won't be very good at yet is um, is just the element of the unknown. Uh, we haven't got a settled side yet because we've still got players coming in signings. We still don't quite know who our uh, best side will be. Um, defensively, we've got a couple of question marks as we get used to the strength and speed of strikers we're not used to playing. Um, mm. And we're still finding our feet in the Premier League. So I think that will uh, that will very much play to your advantage in that you're much more settled and much more sure of how you're going to play than we are. We're, you know, It may very well take us uh, the first 10 games to find our feet and find our players. So it will be a cracking game of football, that I promise you. And yeah, what I, what I really want to leave your listeners with is what I said before, rip up the rule book on Burnley, forget everything you thought you knew about us and enjoy the new brand of Burnley Football Club for 2023 and onwards. Well, you've given it the, the commentator's curse now by saying it'd be a great game of football. So I'm <laughs> written all over it. Uh, I'll take that. With, take that. <laughs> I was going to say, can I end with a score prediction? Is that good, a draw at home? Uh, it, it would be given our opposition, but I will always go with my heart and back the boys. So I'm going to say 2 1 to Burnley. Sorry. I'm not, not having that. Really interesting chat from Natty. That was my favourite opposition segment so far out of the ones we've done. It's only the third of the season, but uh, I really like the way that she kind of bigged up her own club and, and also gave mm-hmm. some respect to Villa as well. I think, like I said, in that piece, it'll be a, a really fascinating game. Let's do predicted 11 then. John, this is the part of the show where you tell me what you think Unai Emery will do rather than what you would do. Uh, we've just beaten Everton 4 in the league and Hibernian 6-0 in the Europa Conference League. Do you change a winning side? Yeah, this probably won't take long. I've gone and changed from the team which Emery picked to play Everton. He obviously made one change in midweek for the Hibs game, which was concert for... Or, no, it wasn't. Sorry, Diego Carlos for Matty Cash. But I can just see Cash coming back in. Uh, I, while I do think Conce is excellent at right back, actually, and he wants to play that back three and he tilt it so the left back plays more advanced and we saw... Luca Dean get a hat trick of assists. Um, oh, I'm just not too sure if he'll do it in an away game against uh, Burnley. I'm, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But um, yeah, I, I just don't think he'll make any changes. This is just a hunch. I don't think he's got too many options. And I think Cash is probably the only one that would maybe drop out for Diego Carlos to come in. If you had to put a percentage chance on Nicolo Zaniolo getting his first start, what would you give it? I know you've not picked him and you predicted 11, so yeah, it's I, I was gonna, no, I'd, Yeah, I'd give it like 20% chance. I, don't, I think it's quite slim just because I think it's a, it's a, at the moment for Villa anyway, it's a winning formula in the forward positions where they've scored nine goals from the exact same midfield, same forward, same uh, obviously McGinn, Bailey, those guys as well. So I, I, I would, would be very uh, shocked if he changed it. But it gives us another option, obviously coming off the bench if he needs to and you know, throughout the season. So I, I do like the signing. But yeah, against Burnley, I just don't think it'll, it'll, nothing drastic will happen, especially when Ramsey's coming back. Um, eventually, Moreno's coming back as well. So those two players will give you more options. Yeah, I think Zaniolo fits the Coutinho role from the Everton game. Somebody you can bring off and, yeah. and, and add a little bit and maybe give him 20, 25 minutes towards the end, obviously dependent on how the, the game is going. Let's end then that, this episode of Inside Body More with predictions. Uh, we are keeping track of our predictions throughout the season. Should we have a little recap of how many points we've got so Go far? Yeah. Um, I'll have to get it up then. <laughs> I thought you'd say no. <laughs> so in my spreadsheet, we've got zero points in the Newcastle game. I thought we'd win. You said a draw and we obviously lost last week for, against Everton. We didn't do these for, for Hibs, by the way, because we didn't do a preview. Uh, last week for Everton, we both went for a Villa win. I said 1-0 because <laughs> I thought it might be a little bit more conservative, which seems wild now thinking back because Everton yeah. are crap. Uh, and you went for a 2-1 win. So we've both yeah. got one point each for the correct outcome nowhere near the correct score line of a 4-0 Burnley away then tough place to go is the is the cliche what are you going for I think if they're a win I'm quite confident actually I think Burnley against City you, it's hard to criticise them but from what we saw they, they went one, uh, one to one man to man which I think will actually probably benefit Villa I think who knows but with the speed that we have on the, uh, on the break in transition I look at the centre halves, and I think Ollie Watkins could have um, could have him on toast. To be honest, that Q Villa failing to score, but yeah, I'd say two one Villa. I was going to say two one, and I'll you can match it. Of, it's a long season, Dan. It's boring, though, isn't it? I'll go three one. <laughs> I'll still yeah, have yeah. the Villa win, but I'll try and try and t- 
try and get a, a head on you by having a different scoreline. So one three away win for me and one two for you. John, thank you very much for your time as always. And um, we'll be back on Sunday afternoon for the post match show. I've got Neil Dunworth from the For the Love of Paul McGrath podcast joining me to talk about hopefully a big win for Villa on the road. And we'll be back, John, you and me are doing the Monday show next week. I think Matt's off because it's Bank Holiday Monday. But we'll still be here doing podcasts because we're hard grafters unlike Kendrick. Thank you very much for tuning into this show and we'll see you on Sunday. Thank you.